So we're going to hear about the projected changes in the climate for Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba from Danny Blair, who's the Director of Science at the Prairie Climate Centre. Danny is a climatologist and a professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Winnipeg, where he's been teaching courses related to climate and the weather since 1987. He's a co-founder and a co-director of the University's Prairie Climate Centre, where he leads a team that provides users of the online Climate Atlas of Canada with high quality data and visualizations of climate projections for all parts of Canada. Danny received his PhD from the University of Manitoba, his MSc and BSc degrees from the University of Regina. Please join me in welcoming Danny Blair. Yeah, that. Uh, first of all, congratulations. What a, what a yeah. fantastic uh, Thank event. You. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm so, so impressed that you brought uh, all these people together. It's so important that we get together in person sometimes. Uh, um, it's an opportunity for me, of course, and all of you to see old friends, Karina, it's been a long time, uh, to um, meet old colleagues and meet new people. So thank you for this. Uh, congratulations. And thank you for the wonderful um, speakers that went ahead of me. Uh, Heather, very nice to see you here. Um, uh, Elaine, thank you for your unwavering support of the Prairie Climate Center and Climate West. And Elder Crochet, uh, thank you so much for everything you do about opening our eyes about reconciliation and how we need to move forward. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, at the Cl Climate Center, if I'm pushing the button here, there we go. We too consider ourselves storytellers, very different from you, not as skilled as you, a very different story to tell. But that's what we do at the Prairie Climate Center. We're telling the story about climate change, about mitigation, about adaptation in the prairies. I'm the science guy. My next, our next speaker is, is uh, not, not uh, a very different kind of uh, person, uh, as you'll see, a very talented man in his own right. And Kara, I promise uh, to go really quickly here. So hang on, uh, hang on. I gave us a talk uh, last week to the Manitoba Liquors and Lotteries Commission or, or a corporation. And one of, this, one of the participants said, I've never had to concentrate so hard because everything went so fast. So here we go. I'll, I'll, I'll try to get going here. And you all know the story anyway. You, you, you know why we're here, but I'll give you uh, a reminder about that if I go forward. Why isn't that going forward? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Uh, so here's my, my story. I have a story to tell uh, too, and I'm gonna tell it really quickly. And I too like to give a shout out to my parents, uh, in particular my dad who uh, installed, instilled in me an, an interest in science. Uh, he was born in Indian Head in 1922 and the carbon dioxide in 1922 was 300, Global concentration of carbon dioxide is 303 parts per million when he was born in Indian Head in 1822. My mom, Edna, who's still alive in Regina, uh, was born in, in uh, 1933. It was 307, a little bit of increase over those 10 years. Oops. I'll get it. And there I am as a little science nerd in 1969 with my little science ducks, 324 already in 1969. And then when I met my wife, uh, Laurel, on the bus that I took here today, on the Route 66 bus, uh, a few years ago, uh, it was up to 407. And of course, it continues. And here we are in 2022, the carbon dioxide concentration that, as Heather pointed out, is so, so important to where our global climate will go. Last year, it was at Mount Aloha, it was 418 parts per million. And it's going to continue to rise until we meet that net zero situation at some point. Let's, let's hope we do so. Uh, so over my lifetime, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has increased by 32 percent. I'm 65 years old. 65 years has increased 32 percent. And since pre-industrial, it's increased uh, 49 percent. Humanity has had an enormous impact upon the con concentration of carbon dioxide and the state of the environment as a whole, of course. This is just something we have to address. That's, that's why we have to adapt. That's why we have to mitigate. And of course, this means that the global temperature has risen as well in the uh, uh, relative to the pre-industrial period, 2022 was 1.16 degrees Celsius above normal. Uh, the green zone there, the Danny Blair period, uh, the global average temperatures increased to almost one degree. So over a very short period of time, the global climate has changed dramatically. 
and uh, it's going to continue to do so. And the reason is uh, the carbon dioxide. If you look at all the forcing agents that uh, all the forcings that go into the climate system that cause the change, uh, change in the temperature or the, the change in the radiation uh, that, that contributes to heating in the globe, the carbon dioxide, the purple line, is the, is the one that's uh, most uh, important. And this is why we concentrate on the carbon dioxide. So much of the radiative forcing, so much of the warming is contributed specifically by the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Volcanoes once in a while cools down for a year or two. Um, there's a little bit of variation in solar solar uh, uh, input. Tropospheric aerosols and the albedo of the surface of the world are, are, have, have allowed us to uh, experience a little bit of global dimming, if you will. But the signal is dominated by carbon dioxide. Our future is determined by uh, emissions. And uh, we don't have time to go into great detail there. And, and uh, uh, all of you, I think, know about this. But the uh, amount of radiative forcing that we've increased um, uh, since pre-industrial is about 2.7 watts per square meter, and that's that's what's caused the one degree warming or so. And so the amount of warming that we will experience and the trajectory that uh, we will follow deter is determined by the carbon dioxide emissions that go into the atmosphere uh, principally. Uh, the, you've all heard about the RCPs, and we're going to see, see this briefly here. The RCPs are the scenarios, the low carbon scenario, the high carbon scenario, the business as usual scenario, the different paths that we might follow in terms of global carbon emissions. Those are what's going to determine what the temperature of the world will be. Uh, we don't know which path we're going to continue to follow. There are good signs that we're bending the curve and we're going to follow a, a lower RCP, or now we call them uh, SSPs in the new CMIP-6 data that's so well presented uh, on, on various platforms. Um, so which path we follow will determine which, which temper we're going to follow. And the climate models, including the Canadian climate models, clearly sh sh show us that we should not follow the high carbon scenarios. We should not follow the high SSPs or the high RCPs because that takes us to a world by the end of the century that will be uh, um, dramatically warmer and not a very nice place for our kids and their kids and their kids. Let's try to keep it down to the low carbon scenario. Um, and by the low carbon scenario here in my slides that are coming up here and I'm going to whiz by really quickly, I'm referring to the 4.5 scenario and that the RCP 4.5. And I say that because that's the RCP that we feature on the Prairie Climate Atlas, on the Climate Atlas of Canada at, uh, at the Prairie Climate Center. And the high carbon business as usual, we can't do that is the 8.5 scenario. And so another thing to keep in mind is that Canada is warming at a greater rate than the world as a whole. In general, Canada and parts, uh, southern Canada in particular is warming at double the global rate and the Arctic is warming at about triple the global rate. And um, that's, that's an eye opener to a lot of people. You know, you hear the world's warming up by two degrees. Well, that means four degrees for Canada. Of course, it's just proportionally uh, uh, seen across the, the seasons, but we'll, we'll see that in a second here. So what are the observed and projected temperatures? Well, the Prairie Climate, the Climate Atlas of Canada at, at our, uh, on our website that gets so many hits and is used, uh, we're so grateful that it's being used so much. We, we highlight what, what uh, the projections say. We don't have time to look at the Climate Atlas of Canada. Show of hands, how many people have been to the Climate Atlas of Canada? Oh, yay. Uh, fantastic. Uh, it, it, we're very proud. Uh, we're in the process of updating the data from the CMIP-5 data to the CMIP-6 data sometime later this summer. We hope to have the new version of the data up there. We'll still have the CMIP-5. And uh, uh, of course, there's so many things buried in that atlas that tell, show us that the environment is changing in, in so many different ways. Uh, annual temperature, here's a bunch of graphs. I'm the graph guy. And here, here are some graphs that uh, I've created for uh, a lot of stations across Canada and across the prairies. The red line at the top there is the, RC, the, the RCP, a smooth version of the RCP 8.5. And the blue at, uh, lower carbon one is the RCP 4.5. The, all the wiggle lines, the, the black lines there are, in this case, the annual maximum temperature observed in Winnipeg. I took, took, took all the stations within 50 kilometers of Winnipeg from the Global uh, Historical Climate Network. And I put them all on one graph, calculated the average annual temperature, average annual maximum temperature. And this graph, as does so many other graphs, shows that things have really changed. Uh, of course, there is enormous noise in our climate. What a crazy climate we have in Canada. What a crazy, wonderful, beautiful, uh, interesting climate we have in the prairies. It is, it is, um, it, its feature is variability. It's, it's, it's always going to have a lot of variability. So if we 
go forward in time, imagine that box there, and that is not, not a statistical uh, box in it by any means, but that that box is capturing the range of temp annual temperatures that you see that we've seen over, over those years back to 1950 or so. Put that box forward on that red line. Put that box forward on the blue line. We are going to see temperatures of the sort that whether we follow the high and or when we follow the blue, let's let's say it that way, we are still going to have enormous amount of ups and downs from year to year. Um, it, that's just not going to go away. And so if I zoom through here, here's, here's Winnipeg's min, minimum temperatures. Here's Winnipeg's annual uh, mean temperatures. Here's Brandon. Um, of course, again, there's so much variability over a long period of time and from year to year, but the red and the blue lines clearly indicate that we are expected to go in a very different, or an upwards direction, of course. Um, here's Weyburn, here's Regina, my whole hometown. Um, uh, here's Swift Current, here's Lethbridge. Uh, the fit, of course, isn't perfect for a lot of these. This is just the nature of the modeling process and, and, the, and the weather process. And, and, and Calgary, uh, in, in short, they all show the data, the observed data shows that we've, we're changing. We're still very variable and the models tell us, get ready for more. Hopefully it stabilizes at a place that isn't horrible. Uh, the seasonal temperatures are another aspect. I, I never look at annual temperatures. You know, who, who, who talks about annual temperatures except for the global scale? Here's Winnipeg summer maximum temperatures. Notice that in, um, uh, in recent decades, we've had some really cold uh, summers. We haven't had uh, anything like that for a while, and we're projected to have really warm summers and forward. Here's the winter temperatures, of course. We have enormous variability in the prairie climate, especially in the winter time. Look back in 1877-78, there was an incredible spike anomaly that was related to a super El Nino that occurred in the late eight, in 1877-78. It killed a lot of people in Asia. Uh, didn't do too much here other than produce some really unusual weather in March and um, and the winter as a whole. But those those winters have got warmer a lot already in, in the Danny Blair period in the 65 years that I've experienced. The winters are very different on the prairies and going to continue to do so. Uh, here's the springs and la la la. I'm going to move along here. It's the same story no matter what time of the year. Winter is the strongest signal so far. But uh, the, the problem, of course, with the, uh, the change in the means is that it changes the probability of the extremes. And we're seeing so much now, deservedly so, about the extreme high temperatures. Um, this, is, this is something we just will have to adapt to, that no matter whether we follow the 4.5 or the, or the 8.5 or something in between, we're going to have to deal with more extreme high temperatures. Fewer of those cold temperatures on the left of the graph we're still going to have some extreme cold events. Uh, that's part of our climate system, but fewer of them. But we're going to have, unfortunately, more of these kind of events, as we saw in Lytton in 2021, a temperature of 49.6 degrees that just was uh, stunning, uh, just uh, remarkable. And there's a lot in the literature now, uh, including over the last couple of weeks, about research that shows that these kind of unexpected statistical anomalies are, are something that we just have to get ready for more often. Now, I, I do appreciate, I, I highlight the negative, you know, we, uh, or I have, I'm accused of highlighting the neg negative. There are, of course, opportunities produced by these temperature changes and climate changes in the prairies, especially with agriculture and, and some aspects of energy consumption. But uh, there's a lot of negatives, especially in the long run, which is how I like to think. And of course, precipitation is an, uh, is an important part of our climate as well, for, uh, for many reasons. And of course, you've all heard that the warmer the, the atmosphere gets, the more water vapor it can hold. And therefore, we should expect, and as we're seeing, we should expect more intense precipitation events. Even if the precipitation doesn't change, we should expect more precipitation intensity, higher precipitation intensity, which is uh, not conducive to um, a lot of things. That has causes a lot of problems at the surface. Generally, we expect in the prairies and across Canada to, to get wetter as a whole, but we expect the, uh, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty associated with precipitation, as there always is, including in this long-term modeling process. But a lot of the models indicate that the later, latter parts of the summer uh, will be drier than they are now. Not terribly drier, but even just a little bit drier uh, on top of, of really warmer is, is uh, a recipe for drought, of course. And indeed, one of the things that we expect in the, warmer, in the, the changing climate, uh, I'll skip over that, is that we should expect um, 
um, more uh, variability in our precipitation and, and, and every other aspect of our climate. And of course, we've experienced this lately. Here's the last last spring. We had an incredibly wet spring here in Winnipeg. My basement got wet. My yard had a, was a lake, and, and as admitted, uh, was the case in many parts of southern Manitoba. Just a, a crazy amount of variability in our climate, and even more so uh, coming. So, what are the prairies? What should the prairies expect? We should expect all the things that you know about. Uh, higher temperatures, shorter, warmer winters, longer, hotter summers, more frequent heat waves, more frequent droughts, uh, more intense rainfall events, changing hydrological seasons. The timing of, of our seasons is changing in a profound way and will continue to do so. Still going to get those cold events that we always have to be ready to, uh, to deal with. Um, and as I'll show you in a second here, if uh, and I'll do it very quickly, the, the climates are marching northward. The American climates south of us are marching towards us. And uh, the, the Winnipeg's climate is marching towards the north. Uh, and even more variability in the weather system than we already enjoy or suffer. And undoubtedly surprises. Uh, as, as climatologists, we are very often surprised at, at the intensity uh, and the early onset of, of some of these extreme events. There's, there's things happening there. And, and Heather pointed out about the oceans being so important. There's a lot in the news late um, this uh, last couple of weeks or so about how warm the oceans are. Oceanographers are going like, what the heck's going on with the oceans? We just came out of a La Nina, and yet the oceans are warmer than they've ever been. And uh, this uh, doesn't um, bode well for many things. And so uh, very quickly, uh, thermal climate migration, uh, I, I did a project for, for Climate West and, and myself about uh, whose climate are we going to have in the future. Uh, climate analogs are a good way to show people that, yes, our climate is going to be very different. And, and uh, if, if we change in the way that we say, who's, who has that climate now? And it's a good way to, you know, to look south to see how they adapt to the weather conditions that we're going to have in the future. And I'm just going to zip forward here and look at the, the summer. That's the more dramatic one. Here's the summer average ma maximum temperatures in Winnipeg under the low carbon scenario, the 4.5. And if you can read on the right there, the, the legend on the right, those 15-year periods are color-coded. The red ones are the, are, the, are the average temperatures in 2081 to 2095, if I can read my from here. Uh, those red places are places that currently have the climate that Winnipeg is projected to have in 2081-2095. Uh, those places uh, down in um, the Midwest United States and, and elsewhere are places that currently have the climate that we're projected to have in 2081-2095 under the low carbon scenario. And here it is another high carbon scenario. Uh, um, Kansas, uh, uh, the, the temperatures that are observed in Kansas now are expected or the last 20 years, are the temperatures that we're expected to have in Winnipeg in the year 2895. So I've done it by 15 year periods. All of these are available on the Climate Atlas of Canada. It's kind of hidden right now. You have to put in slash analogs at the end of the Climate Atlas address, uh, but that will be uh, corrected soon. But um, the climates are, are marching forward. And, um, and, um, there we go. And Heather mentioned the climate adaptation strategy. These are the kinds of things that we have to get ready for. And we are very proud to be mentioned in the in the in the um, in the uh, the plan uh, as an as an example of a university institution, a research center that can contribute to the awareness and uh, planning uh, adaptation planning process. We're very happy about that. So uh, there are, there's reason for us to be here. There's reason for us to continue to meet and deal with this in, a, in an appropriate way, in an aggressive way, in a, uh, in, a, in a way that will minimize the risks and maximize the opportunities. Uh, working with Prairie Climate Center, working with Climate West, whoever is, is, uh, is available to help you identify what, the, what your risks are, your vulnerabilities, and move forward. Because it's, uh, it's not going to, going to go away. There's, there's, no, there's no magic wand. Um, there's a lot of really good action going on in Manitoba, Alberta, and Saskatchewan, and Canada as a whole, to and, and the globe as a whole, to minimize our carbon emissions and um, minimize our risk and maximize our opportunities when available. But it takes effort. And congratulations for bringing everybody together to move forward. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
I wanted to give you the mic. Just we'll take one or two questions, and then we're going to have one more presentation before the break. We're going to push you hard now, but then we'll be nice to you after the break. <laughs> Um, yeah, so for those of you online who may have joined us, we do have a mentimeter.com to ask questions, or if you want to verbally ask a question, type type that into the chat and we'll get you up on the screen. For those in the room, if you had any questions for Danny, now would be a good time. Let's just, just go to Brett. Just go to Brett? Yeah. Well, I actually don't see anyone waving their hand yeah, for yeah, questions, so... Yeah, okay, and we will make more time for questions after Brett, so we'll take your suggestion on that. So thank you very much, Danny.